Hello, good morning, everybody. We will get started shortly. Hi, good morning, good afternoon to those who are joining us. We'll just get started in a few seconds here. Hello, good morning, good afternoon to everybody who's joining us today. Welcome to the public presentation of the James J. McCarthy Arctic Indigenous Youth Leaders. My name is Aditi Kumar and I'm the Executive Director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to call your attention to the interpretation button at the bottom right side of your screens. Please feel free to turn it on to English or Russian uh, if you would like uh, to interpret the event. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to meet Anders Oskol and Swain Matheson at the Kennedy School in the spring of 2020, back when we were still meeting in person. It was an absolute pleasure to get to know them uh, when the idea of the seminar was just being formed. Um, and they shared with me their history of working with the Belfer Center and especially Professor Jim McCarthy on elevating indigenous knowledge. It's exciting to see how far this idea has come since that first meeting. The Belfer Center is committed to bringing in more diverse voices and perspectives into the conversations that we're hosting at the Kennedy School. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to listen to young indigenous leaders from the Arctic about the challenges they are seeing and the possible solutions they propose to address them. A special thank you uh, to Brittany Janis, who is the force behind this event. And I'm sure uh, you will see all of the hard work that she and the team have put into it. Uh, we're really proud at the Belfer Center of the work of the Arctic Initiative and couldn't be happier to welcome you all today. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Hatla Lagodotir, who's the co-founder and co-director of the Arctic Initiative to continue to welcome you and give you an overview of the agenda for the program. Hatla, over to you. Thank you so much, Aditi. It's not possible for me, Brittany, to turn on my video for some reason. There we go. <laughs> Magic. Um, first of all, thanks so much, Aditi, for these uh, inspiring words. It's indeed uh, very important for the Arctic Initiative to be situated within the Balfour Center, where uh, uh, we are looking at such a diverse set of issues, just like we have in the Arctic. And I have to say, Aditi, if you, if you, uh, when you will listen to the ideas that will be presented here and uh, the ones that were presented earlier today as well. It's incredible to see how much progress these amazing students from across the Arctic have managed to do in just a week time. And I would like to echo um, uh, special thanks, uh, of course, to all these incredible participants, but to Brittany and Joel, Antes, Oscar, uh, Bob, and others that have been engaged in this and, and uh, make this such an uh, interesting and exciting uh, venture that I think we're only starting. And um, with that, um, we're gonna, I'm going to be passing on uh, the torch uh, to Anders and Dr. Bob Corral, who are going to speak uh, about uh, Jim McCarthy. Uh, we are hosting this seminar in, in his memory. And I think for all of you that knew uh, Jim, uh, you would have been inspired by his work. He, um, I remember when I was in the process uh, with John and Henry in developing and establishing the Arctic Initiative, he was such a source of inspiration. He always had time to meet. He was always generous with his advices. 
So a true inspiration of the mindset and openness that we need to solve the, the many uh, challenges that we're facing in the Arctic region. So I'm going to pass this now over to uh, Anders and Bob, and then we're going to move to the student presentations um, um, and uh, to Dr. John Holtren, uh, who is uh, the co-founder of the Arctic Initiative. So uh, the floor is yours, Anders and Bob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good day, good evening, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, we will uh, first and foremost like to recognize uh, Susan McCarthy, Jim's wife. Uh, also to recognize Professor John Holdren, Dr. Henry Lee. Uh, Executive Director Aditi Kumar, it's very nice to see you all again, albeit uh, by Zoom only this time. We would also like to recognize our Indigenous students, uh, the students uh, at, uh, of Arctic Issues at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, all Harvard colleagues and guests. Uh, it was with deep sorrow that we received the news in December 2019 of, of Jim's passing. And we have for some time uh, since been thinking about a way in which we could honor him and his memory and his strong engagement uh, in the Arctic. Now, admittedly, this is uh, a very difficult task, but we will try to give it a go. And with me, we have, uh, I have uh, uh, Dr. Robert Corral and uh, Dr. Swain Matheson, who uh, both have been able to, to work with uh, Jim in different respects, in different ways. And uh, so we will try to, to bring our perspectives uh, to his, his uh, work and, and basically... If you could include me on the video, I'm also... Oh, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, Jim had... Uh, internationally, he held uh, a very high respect. And uh, I don't think we will be able to really highlight uh, the depth and breadth of his, his engagement and leadership, uh, giving the full picture. But we will try to give uh, our our perspectives. And uh, I thought it appropriate to bring forth the, the words of Vice President Al Gore uh, for you here. Perhaps, Bob, you could, uh, you could elaborate a bit further on Jim's role in academic leadership uh, around the environment of the Arctic. Uh, it's a delight to do so. Um... Jim arrived at Harvard in the mid 1970s and it became pretty clearly the fact that he carried a rather remarkable agenda. Not only was he an academic in every sense of the word, but he was a passionate man that understood the need to connect across disciplines of science, cultures and the like. Often we talked about him as the man about the affairs of the Arctic and its people, indigenous in particular. Uh, Jim also did a remarkable job of translating some of the reality that was in his very soul about interconnectivity, about knowledge, people, and the future of the planet. And it, it evolved over time into a number of things. By the mid-1980s, he was widely known for his incredible understanding and inventing ideas to focus us in on things. One of which was to bring into the lexicon of conversation, the idea <coughs> of vulnerability. And in fact, led with a number of his PhD students and some of uh, many of our postdoctoral students, the idea of exploring that idea to the extent that it finally became an organic part uh, of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which he ultimately chaired its working group too, which was designed to look at impact and consequences 
but he also felt that vulnerability in the English language, not always easily interpreted in other languages, was a way of making it very personal. And so Jim did, did some remarkable things. He transformed how the IPCC saw itself in the future, which is the intergovernmental panel, which is really the tool of implementing the 1992 UN framework for climate change. Um, and it eventually translated not only to that arena, but back to the home of, of our people, uh, the science community. And so it went from IPCC world to beginning to putting it into the everyday life of our work. And in about 19, in the mid 1990s, the idea of a focus on the Arctic evolved. And it was evolving in the Arctic Council, it was evolving in the science community, and it was also evolving in what is called the, <clears throat> the International Arctic Science Committee. And so by the year 2000, it was invented into an assessment of the character of the Arctic called the <clears throat> Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. Uh, as a colleague, I can only say without Jim, that enterprise would have less of its depth uh, of penetration into the world because he was so powerfully passionate about being certain that the indigenous voice was heard, that the local voice of people throughout the Arctic was heard, and that we in science had the capacity to absorb not only our own knowledge, but the knowledge that is so well vested in the lives of every one of you gathered here today uh, from across the Arctic in your indigenous communities and within your language. Jim understood that this idea that language and culture were inexorably connected. They're not separate. In some ways, uh, if you have language, you have culture. And if you have culture, you have meaning to the people who live within it. So out of that came the, uh, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. Uh, and Jim helped us immensely. For example, it's a 17 chapter report that finally came out in its full form in 2004 and five. But with Jim's help, every single chapter engaged indigenous expertise, not as, not as a, a outsider, but as an organic part. In fact, we urged every one of the chapters to do everything, not only for the assessment, to publish their work. And I recall vividly that one of them was, <clears throat> had their paper work published by the National Academy of Sciences. And I recall vividly two of my friends in the indigenous community coming up to me and says, I published a scientific paper and I'm in the National, uh, uh, National <clears throat> the US National Academy. So that kind of integration became organic. But there were also some difficulties and they finally resolved by Jim leading an effort that ended up to be chapter 17, which was really organically to connect it all. So that's kind of a beginning, Anders, I'll let it pass back to you and we can pick up from there. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And um, uh, as uh, many of our, our, all of our students here today, and our organizations are uh, indigenous uh, from the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. I'd like to just say that uh, we also have a history of, of relating to Jim, which is perhaps unknown to many. Uh, I myself work for the Association of World Brotherhood, which organize 24 different indigenous peoples who are uh, basically the nomadic uh, Arctic indigenous peoples. And uh, indeed, um, we have uh, worked also, as we should see with Jim, on the idea of having a type of a training, educational capacity building initiative, which we will return to. And so, Bob, you, you touched upon uh, parts of this timeline, which we uh, don't expect you to read through. We just want to show the substance and 
and uh, it's of the, the collaboration that we've had with, uh, with Jim and his impacts on our work uh, also in aftermath of his passing. Um, and the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment was mentioned. And to us as Indigenous peoples, it still represents a best case of how you can combine different ways of knowing, how you can combine the scientific insights with uh, traditional Indigenous knowledge. And uh, for our part, much of uh, that, uh, the focus of, of uh, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment was Bake into chapter 17. And I wonder, uh, Dr. Matisse, if you could uh, say a few words about this, this chapter and how it, it came about and how it, how it was done. Thank you, Anders, and good morning, everyone. It's fantastic to honor Jim in the way we do now because he was big. Yes, he was the AAAS uh, president, he was the professor, but he was. It's not all the people you meet in that high academic standard who's big enough to actually include the weakest, who was the hit by the Arctic and the, all these are different changes in the Arctic. And he said, welcome, we're going to develop new methods. And actually, yes, as Bob said, as Anna said, we had some problems to include this chapter in Arctic Climatic Impact Assessment because Jim was actually facilitated uh, the indigenous knowledge should play a role, you know, in this assess, this is the people. And he came up to me in 2002. You have to remember, Sven, that these indigenous people I hit more than twice. I went to his office in 2002 and, and yeah, here we are, that's my picture. And we used this blackboard. As you see, it's a lot of fascinating thing about resilience. How should we actually develop the resilience, adapting capacity and resilience of the indigenous community? And that came out of his IPCC report following to this chapter seven. Together, all of us, uh, you look at the author list too, it's a lot of indigenous uh, uh, authors from Samiland here in Norway, uh, Finland, and also Russia. And um, <clears throat> it came a lot of interesting papers here. So the idea was to develop an Arctic vulnerability center. You know, you said Jim and Bob, they produce a lot of, of articles, but they always included the reindeer herders. I mean, that was not common in Norway. And a lot of the research institutes say no. So that's why I mean, he was so big to include those young people, uh, academic, no, uh, traditional reindeer herders who came. Also, you are Matthias Thury, senior reindeer herders, went with Bob and me to, to James' office. And we developed this framework. Actually, we developed this framework for vulnerability, the opposite of resilience, adaptation to projecting climate change in the Russian Arctic. And subsequently, we get all these different community apart. And a lot of scientific articles, also with Jim's name, came out of it. It would have been impossible without his ability to include, ability to in understand the different uh, indigenous partners' uh, challenges, the difficult to play, the difficult to use the indigenous knowledge. It changed the whole Arctic. I'm really, uh, Susan, saying thank you. That was fantastic. And you see on the list there is a lot of things. We also made new research uh, proposals to the Research Council of Norway, to the EU. And here is some of the people, this Mary Beth, uh, she worked for, for Jim, Greta Hovisur from Norway. She, she was there, we looked a little bit younger at that time. I think this was at the evaluation of the uh, Arctic Climatic Impact Assessment with uh, Jim Hall in New Hampshire. And this is some of the work we did because we got different kinds of responses. A lot of, I, this week I've been reading the referees comment to some of the application we made. It's 
should be published by itself, I think. Uh, so that was unique. Even today it was unique, just 20 years ago, and he allowed his postdocs and PhD students to come to Norway to meet reindeer herders. We, we got some food, we got some drinks, but we were working, <coughs> pardon me, working very hard to, to write out the idea of a resilience approach to reindeer husbandry. This is in the Sami reindeer herders office um, with different, uh, uh, different, uh, of, uh, of, of um, different people from Jim's laboratory at Harvard. And uh, you see Bob there, and you see some of our active scientists today. I mean, a lot of PhDs and masters came out of this initiative. Fantastic. And they are in the business of science and adaptation, building their own communities today. So it's only to say a big thank you. Of course, uh, by his uh, generous opening of doors for our, our networks, our people, we could see a few timelines going back and forth between uh, the start of this with his, his co-leading the IPCC uh, and leading into our own uh, participation of, of uh, the fifth assessment report of IPCC in 2014. That would not have been at all possible uh, without his, his strong support and his, his uh, vision and leadership. Uh, and also another timeline which we could mention, this is from uh, the Belfer Center's webpage uh, back in 2002 where there was an event on the Arctic Vulnerability Study, and, and that links, of course, very much to our event today. So these are some of the timelines and some of the, the connections between the, the early work of, of Jim together also with our team and uh, the, the potential, I think, uh, looking forward. I would like to highlight uh, a matter which I believe is important. It was not given that, that Jim would continue on from, from IPCC uh, with this work, but when he did enter into the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment and what came after, this was in fact also based on a concern of his for Arctic Indigenous peoples. Now, you don't have to take my word for that. Uh, this is from an interview with Jim in 2019, where he highlights that the Arctic is also a community of people, indigenous peoples of the Arctic, who are in many ways on the, the front lines of, of uh, Arctic change. And as was mentioned, Jim had a, a, a wonderful ability to see through and, and uh, express the situations. And, one of the things that we remember uh, a lot about him is, is that he pointed to that the Arctic indigenous communities are hit twice. First of all, by climate change in the Arctic, uh, but secondly, also by mitigation effects. And as we've heard uh, our students uh, this week talk about the mitigation effects uh, to climate change, windmills, hydroelectrical power uh, dams and so on is a matter of, of great concern. And um, we uh, also had uh, different uh, meetings with, with Jim uh, after. This is from Helsinki, where we were meeting in relation to the Arctic Council. Uh, and I think it was actually at this particular uh, time that we also discussed the possibility with Jim of having, uh, we had an idea about a summer school at Harvard for our indigenous students. And uh, his response to this was that that could be a very good idea. He was in support, but he said we should rather do it in winter. And that is uh, basically what we have been doing this week. And so in building our educational efforts, training efforts for, uh, for our future leaders, uh, we try to remember that we need to build not only the competence of our youth, but also their confidence and their, their contacts, connections. 
using both science, the latest of science, and also our own traditional indigenous knowledge. Perhaps, um, uh, Bob and Sven, you could uh, comment a bit on uh, the ways forward from here. Sven, you take first, I'll follow. I, I, I do that. Thank you, Anna. Uh, uh, you see our engagement, and uh, this is only the beginning. We have to take the voice of the indigenous students we have this week, more than 30 students from all over the Arctic, from the Aleutan to Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Samiland. Also, we have people, young people from Iceland, all the way to Eastern Siberia and Yakutsk in a Belfield Center course. I think that's fantastic. And we are able to work together, you know. We're able to gradually respect, like a gym, include our different thoughts and work together. So this is very optimistic for the future Arctic. So we are not going to stop there, you know. Well, this is just the beginning, Susan, on the idea he provided when I met him in 2002. We're going to work, uh, and I haven't discussed that with the leadership in Belfast Center, but, 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 but Anders and me and Bob, have, we are going to provide scholarship for you, students who like to continue in specific programs at Harvard. We're going to work that out uh, in the name of Professor Jim McCarthy. We think that's the idea by the whole seminar here, that we are open the doors for the indigenous people. They should have the best education available. And that's what Harvard has provided. You have provided a space where there's no racism, no harassment. You could say whatever you like, and you could come with all your knowledge, and you could learn other knowledges. That means that we also would like to have a future series of seminars uh, on this topic. Uh, very soon, we are going to have a seminar of intellectual, intellectual property rights together with WIPO in you and in Geneva. One of the students here, she come from Kratznoyar in Siberia. She works there now. And we're going to soon provide a seminar on the intellectual property rights and indigenous people. And we're going to continue, like Anish probably will say also. Uh, please, Bob. Yes. Yeah, I just can Lou, look, I think we can sort of brand what it is we've been doing by something Jim said to me many years ago. It's the affairs of the Arctic and its people. That's kind of where Jim put it all together, giving you all kinds of other details about climate change and geopolitical dynamics and all the other stuff that, but the focal point is that the affairs of the Arctic and its people mostly focused on those who've had thousands of years of presence in the Arctic, the indigenous community and their culture and maintaining that culture as a component in a world affairs. And Svein has given you some ideas about things, but one of the things I will be touch base with all of you, the students, ways to maintain the momentum for each of you. And we'll talk about that over the days and weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Are yeah. you? Yes, rounding off, I would just like to say that I, I sincerely hope uh, we have been able to, to do uh, Jim justice in the session and by our work with the students uh, for the wonderful and marvelous person that he was. And what does it mean to have a colleague like Jim uh, and to have his, his support and his vision? What does it mean to have a friend like Jim? To us, it meant the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anter Swain and, and Bob, for these thoughtful um, uh, remarks about Jim's incredible work and journey, where he focused so much on, on collaboration and finding solutions, uh, as you say. And on that note, we're going to be moving to uh, student solutions. Uh, we're going to be hearing from three teams 
that have been working on developing an idea to address a challenge, a local challenge that they care about. Uh, and to the audience here that is not a part uh, or has not participated with us in this development, you know, normally we have this program as a course at HKS uh, over the period of six weeks. We have now condensed that to a week. Still hearing the students earlier today and, and thinking, as you say, Swain and Bob and, and Antes, how we can think about taking this to the next level gives me so much hope. So um, I am happy to introduce uh, the first uh, team that is going to uh, present here. Uh, that is group five, uh, JC Firth Hagen and Esther Halstotter that have developed an idea related to mental health, addressing mental health. So JC and Esther, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will begin with a made up story for our group pitch presentation on the suicide epidemic in Nunavut. And for a trigger warning, content warning, there is discussions of mental health and suicide. Jane lives in Nunavut, the largest and most unique territory in Canada. Nunavut is also the proud home to Inuit for over 4,000 years. It is a remote territory of over 35,000 people, of which most are Inuit. Jane has been having a very difficult time with stress and mental health. She does not know where to turn and it is only getting worse. She wants to reach out and get help, but there is a stigma associated with mental health challenges and services are many miles away. She is feeling alone and isolated. She is getting afraid and doesn't know what to do. Thousands of people in Nunavut are experiencing the same challenges as Jane. The problem. In fact, Nunavut has one of the highest rate suicide rates in the world. The suicide rate among Inuit in Canada is about 10 times higher than the rates among the general Canadian population. In addition, the stigma associated with mental health stops many people from seeking help. Nunavut's mental health problems can be explained by the effects of a rapid transition and government control that have cost Nunavut, or sorry, that have cost Inuit many of their traditional ways and independence. Since the creation of a comprehensive action plan in 2017, to respond to the suicide epidemic, the government of Nunavut has implemented a number of measures, such as a 24-7 helpline and a trauma crisis unit. However, these have not been enough. Just as recently as June 2020, residents gathered to peacefully protest and raise awareness for the need for greater access to local treatment within their communities and their towns provided by Inuit counselors that understand the challenges Inuit face and can ensure that the service will be rooted in the Inuit culture. Solution, what we are proposing is to establish mobile mental health units throughout Nunavut that are specifically adapted to the needs of Inuit. Inuit. These units, which would be a vans or trucks, would go between communities in Nunavut and provide Inuit with mental health services, both emergency assistance, diagnosis, and treatment. The idea is based on mobile mental health units that already exist in Canada. However, what makes our proposal unique is that one, our units would visit remote places that are currently underserviced and two, the units would be staffed with locally tra in trained Inuit mental health professionals. By hiring and training Inuit professionals, we also aim to reduce the stigma and increase accessibility. And with closing, with the establishment of these mobile mental health units, Jane and thousands of other people suffering from mental health issues in Nunavut could now receive accessible and appropriate mental health services. 
Now we aim to launch a pilot and are seeking your assistance. Thank you, Masicho. Wonderful. Um, thank you for this good work. I suggest because it's hard for us to uh, to give a virtual round applause of applause in this system that you use the chat. That's um, the space where we can provide uh, information and, and share what we thought and so forth. All right, but we're going to move to our next presenters. Um, Jay, we're, that is uh, Freddy R. Olin and Susanna Israelson and Victoria Kutuk Bushman, who are going to be speaking about a think tank solution to address uh, challenges in their region. So over to you. Hello, everyone. I will start the presentation now. Do you know how it feels to be invisible and to be silenced? One quarter of all land on earth is owned, managed, used, or occupied by indigenous peoples. Too often outside influences forced natural resource development and extraction projects, while we as indigenous peoples are marginalized as a result. One out of many limitations to achieving greater influence in land use planning and natural resource development is a lack of capacity within indigenous communities, organizations, governments, and working groups to actively participate in planning and policy development activities. The United Nations is increasingly recognizing the importance of and need for indigenous representation and participation in UN activities. The UN has also long recognized that young people are a major human resource for development and key agents for social change, economic growth, and technological innovation. Among indigenous communities, our experts and cultural revitalizers are often youth who have had more opportunities to education, to international cooperation with other communities, and to connect through innovative platforms. By generating capacity for indigenous organizations and communities to effectively assert our rights and to land use planning within international fora, we can better exert influence over culturally relevant uses of space, such as those that are in line with our traditional uses in modern development. We propose the development of an Arctic indigenous youth think tank to interface with international fora for the purpose of identifying opportunities to influence and shape research, policy, and decision-making around land use planning within indigenous homelands. While other indigenous youth networks exist in the Arctic, this think tank aims to bring together youth experts to identify opportunities and ways forward for improved indigenous engagement within these fora, their working groups, and their conferences. By focusing on capacity building within these spaces, such as the development of expertise and influence, decisions made within these fora may better reflect the rights and claims of our communities on land use planning. We deserve a seat at the table, the right to effective participation, and an insurance that our voices, perspectives, and ways of life matter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Freddie. Let's give them a round of applause, even though it's hard to see or hear in this setup. Um, but what is inspiring is to see the potential in many cases of our different student teams to work together. And I think with, with, with this idea, the think tank idea, it kind of relates to some extent to our final idea presented here today, uh, which is uh, presented by uh, Denale Hukton and Samantha Harrison, about uh, how to integrate uh, indigenous uh, knowledge into academic institutions. So over to you. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, indigenous students' academic journey needs to support and prepare us to engage and speak our indigenous knowledge and truth in settler dominated spaces. Harvard is one of the most powerful and far-reaching universities in the world. Our presentation was inspired and as a response to an event that transpired during the James McCarthy Leadership Seminar Series for Future Arctic Indigenous Leaders. 
As we must navigate the new Arctic, Harvard is in a unique position to be on the cusp of the most innovative learning methods and set the precedence for how all academic spaces engage with Arctic indigenous young people from this point on. Indigenous participation in institutional academic settings has a long history. Our ways of knowing have intervened, co-collaborated, critiqued, communed, and largely conflicted with settler ways of thinking. Primary schools to institutions um, with longstanding research legacies have the responsibility to indigenous peoples and settler communities to teach culturally relevant curricula by, for, and with the people they serve. We want to pursue a model where indigenous knowledge learning starts on day one for everyone. There are a multitude of bold action items that we could select to address this identified problem. Our ideal dream, free from obstacles, would be to have a fully funded cohort of Arctic Indigenous fellows through the Arctic Initiative at Harvard University. This is a logical and reasonable option because we know that currently Indigenous knowledge is not recognized as being equal to other westernized knowledge systems in academic settings. This discrepancy is institutionalized as early as kindergarten through evasive curricula that erases indigenous knowledge and stories. Students are assimilated into what is thought of as professional code of conduct, which reinforces respectability politics at the expense of our mental health and well being. The creation of an Arctic Indigenous Fellows cohort at Harvard sets the precedence for what is best practice. Simultaneously, it would provide a platform for Indigenous people to co-create with Harvard meaningful educational experiences. This exemplifies our Arctic indig Indigenous leaders motto, nothing about us without us. We understand that this will take an investment of time to fully flesh out the working components to bring this dream to fruition. We have identified first actionable steps that we can take together. Harvard can support indigenous youth in places that we are already doing this very important work. Currently, the Arctic Council Permanent Participant Youth Network is working on a podcast series to help celebrate the stories of the Arctic Council and educate a global audience on our Arctic indigenous presence. This podcast ser ser series is being done in collaboration with On the Land, an indigenous media collective. Harvard's investment in this podcast will continue the partnership between the Arctic Initiative and Indigenous peoples of the Circumpolar North. Individual stipends and mentorship through Harvard can be provided to Arctic Indigenous youth working to tell these stories. We all want good things for our people and for the Arctic. This is our common goal. Kuranek Puk. And Hajar Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Samantha and Tenali, for, for this presentation that we take to, to our heart at the Arctic Initiative and look forward to discussing further. Um, um, I want to say to all of the teams, also the ones that presented earlier today, it's been such a pleasure to, to work with all of you and to learn from all of you. And I am excited for next step. Um, but on that note, I'm going to pass the torch now over uh, back to you, Brittany, uh, to moderate some, some uh, questions and then pass the torch to John Holtren. So over to you, Brittany. Thank you so much, Hatla. And again, uh, to echo Hatla, uh, I just want to say how impressed and proud I am of the amazing work that all of these young leaders have done this past week. Uh, it's been really inspiring um, and enlightening and we've learned so much. Um, I've certainly learned so much from you and I hope you have all learned a lot from talking to each other uh, and finding ways where you may be able to cooperate with one another. So right now, what I'd love to do is actually ask all of the students um, who were participated in this week to turn on your cameras um, so thank you, Sam, got your camera on, uh, and we're going to put you into gallery view so people can see um, how remarkable uh, this wonderful group of people are. And I'm just going to quickly um, bop around the room uh, and ask you to just say your name 
uh, and where where in the Arctic you are from uh, and your what what is your home community? So, uh, Per Thomas, I have you first. So please introduce yourself. Yes, Boris. My name is uh, Per Thomas Oskol from uh, northern part of Nor Norway. I'm a young uh, reindeer herder from Sami. Thank you. Anja Maria. Boris, Anja Maria. My name is Anja Maria Nisikeskitalu, and I'm from Gordigaitnu, Norway. Alan. Hey, sorry about that. Anyway, uh, my name is Alan Hinson, and I live in Greenland, New York. Thank you, Alan. Um, yeah. JC. Sangrinzi Shilakachi, JC. Kuch in Shagoinli, Nuvik Inkli. My name is JC. I'm from Nuvik Northwest Territories, and I'm Kuch in Dene Masi. Thank you, JC. Denali. Oh, Denali, you're muted. Adet Denali Hodgson, Sa Ezra, Githar the Cheg, South Naknik, Yith Histan, Dina Inna, Hlinena, Listo. Hi, my name is Denali Hodgson. I am calling in from Dina Inna, Hlinena, Anchorage, and I'm originally from Anvik and South Naknik in Alaska. Thank you. Freddie. Hello everyone, my name is Freddie Olin. I am from Tanana, Alaska, and my wife is from Shishmaref, Alaska. We have a one-year-old son learning a new back, uh, thanks to my wife and her mom. Amazing. Lisa. Всем привет, меня зовут Олеся, я э, из России, Чукотский автономный округ Чукотка, э, провинского района, село Новое Чаплино. Я родилась в семье морских охотников, представляю э, национальность эскимосы, эскимосы э, России. Спасибо, Лена. Спасибо. Алло, гуд. Uh, my name is I am Inuk from Greenland, which is also called Kelashinunat. I'm an indigenous rights activist um, and I'm from South Greenland. My name in my language means lovely sun. Amazing. Esther. Hi, my name is Esther and I'm from Iceland. Any? Hi all, my name is Eni Similar and I come from the Finnish side of Sami. Okay. Sam. Hi, my name is Samantha Harrison and I call both Juno and Fairbanks, Alaska home. Susanna. Hi, Puerez Gaika, Munamala Susanna. My name is Susanna and I come from the Swedish part of Sapni. Ina Maria. Ures. My name is Ida Maria Helander and I come from the Finnish side of Sapni. Olga. Um, my name is uh, Olga Nikolaeva. I come from Republic of Sakha Yakutia, Russia. Victoria. Victoria Bushman. My name is Victoria. Good morning. My family is from Okavik, Alaska, but I live now in New Greenland. Anna. Hello everybody, my name is Anna and I am Evenki from Russia, Krasnoyarsk region. Uh, Louisa, you're not, your video isn't on, but if you want to introduce yourself. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Luisa Morfosalova, and I am from Sahar Republic, Russia. Russia. Thank you. Uh, Gubor Ricky. Hi, my name is Kuiper Krike. I come from Hafnarfjörður, Iceland. Darling. may be having trouble with her video. Uh, let's go to Michael. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm from Greenland, but I'm already, but I'm um, living in Copenhagen at the moment. Wonderful. Uh, Anna. Anna, have you already gone? You must have, okay. Uh, Olinka. Okalina. Okalina. Yeah, Kayla, oh. come now. Yeah, Okalina Patricia Lakanov, Gregory from Aleutian Islands. I'm an Elliot born and raised out here on Unalaska Island. Darling, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, my name is Darling, uh, and I'm from Falls Pass, Alaska. And we have a, a few folks whose videos aren't on, but I'll just try calling on them, and hopefully they'll be able to introduce themselves. Uh, Maxime. Всем здравствуйте. Меня зовут Максим. Я представляю Венов из Республики Сахайкуте. Спасибо. Спасибо. Uh, Эдиан. Um, hello, my name is Эдиан. I'm from Калмыкия, uh, Russia. Uh, Arthur. Здравствуйте, я, я из Республики Сахая-Кутия, Россия. Спасибо. Okay, I think that's everyone. Is there anyone who I missed? Because some of the boxes moved around. Um, All right. Me? Ah, Ellen Zara, thank you. Buarek, my name Ellen Zara. Hi, my name is Ellen Zara from South Sami, uh, South Sami part of Norway. I'm a reindeer herder. So for our audience, all of these young leaders, I hope you remember their names and remember their faces. They are going to undoubtedly be extremely important voices in the Arctic dialogue going forward. Uh, and as you can see just by the variety of different languages that you hear and the different uh, faces you see in the different places where people are coming from, it's going to be a really, really diverse and remarkable and inspiring future for the Arctic with these young leaders taking the charge. So with that said, congratulations to everyone. You've officially completed this program. Consider yourselves all graduates of, of this seminar. And I'm going to turn it now over, if you can all turn off your videos, uh, for a closing remarks from Professor John Holdren. So I need you to start my video, Brittany, I think. Uh, okay, let's see if I can do it. Okay, good. So let me uh, first congratulate all of the students who have uh, not just survived, but prevailed in this very uh, intensive program. Uh, we just heard three terrific presentations and I think those were undoubtedly representative of the high quality uh, of the work that all of you have done. 
the second thing I wanna do is uh, say how happy I am that Sue McCarthy and her and Jim's sons, Jamie and Ryan, were able to be with us uh, for this event uh, in Jim's honor. Uh, Jim understood from the very beginning of his career that the most important challenges around environment can neither be understood nor solved without drawing on insights from multiple disciplines and insights from the cultures that are living these challenges. He brought that insight to bear in his scientific work, uh, but also in his very important work at the intersection of science and public policy, uh, and above all, most importantly, his work around the Arctic. And the one further thing I wanna say about Jim is that beyond the interdisciplinary character and the multicultural dimensions of his own work, he was an influential evangelist for that interdisciplinary and multicultural rubric. He used his many platforms to communicate to his students, his mentees, to the wider scientific community and to the policy community, the importance of interdisciplinary and intercultural approaches, both within science and at its intersection with policy. We are uh, incredibly proud of the uh, success we have had in this event in bringing together over 30 indigenous youth from around the circumpolar Arctic for conversations around leadership, indigenous knowledge, and co-production of knowledge, all of which will be critical for the future of the Arctic, and all of which were central important issues in Jim McCarthy's uh, career and his life. I wanna thank the Association of World Reindeer Herders, the International Center for Reindeer Husbandry, the Arctic Council Indigenous Peoples Secretariat, and the Arctic Elot Institute for their work in creating this process. And of course, I want to thank the incomparable Brittany Janice, the incomparable Hatla Logadeter, and all of the members of the Harvard Kennedy School Arctic Initiative for the work that they contribute to this effort. And I wanna thank the many other participants, uh, literally from around the world, that helped to make this event a resounding success. And I will conclude just by saying that we mark at this point, not a completion, but simply an important step forward on our journey together. Thank you all so much. Brittany, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Don't forget the picture. <laughs> Absolutely. We can definitely take, take a group picture. Um, if everybody wants to turn on their cameras, I'll take a quick screenshot. And as we do that, um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and I know, Anders, you wanted to say a quick thanks as well. So while we take a picture, go ahead. Thank you, Professor Holdren. Um, we would like to, of course, congratulate and uh, commemorate our students who are, in our mind, all winners. We thank uh, Harvard, the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, the Balfour Center, and the Arctic Initiative for working together on this uh, important initiative. And especially we too would like to uh, thank Hatla and Brittany who have done some pretty heavy lifting to get us all uh, through this. Also, we would like to thank the, the faculty uh, at Harvard and our guest speakers from, from other institutions, our interpreters who help us understand each other, and also the tech uh, staff at uh, Harvard Kennedy School. So on behalf of World Reindeerhood is ICR and our, our uh, Arctic Institute, we, we thank you and we really look forward to the continuation. Thank, Thank you all. You. And with that, I'm going to end this webinar. And if the students join us back in our classroom, we will see you all there. Thanks so much and congratulations.